Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Bikini and the Brain podcast. I am here with a coach, Adam Bonilla from Team Elite Physique, the man, the myth, the legend. You already know, Adam Bo. <laughs> that was a good that intro. Was good. That was you really should good. maybe do the intro. Shoot, you're right. <laughs> and my name is Ashley. Hey, fit. Just little Ashley. Well, look at little Ashley. And uh, oh, yeah, I hope you guys like our shirts today. Uh, I'm Team Adam today. <laughs> Which and, is a taped uh, out shirt. No, it's not. Sh- <laughs> <laughs> these are from um, Angel Competition yeah, Bikinis. Angel's Competition. Big shout out. Thank you for making these yeah. awesome shirts for us. And the and back is really cute. They too. gave me all of my <laughs> all of my jobs that I do with Ashley. Yes. I hope you can, can see them. But these are all my jobs. <laughs> I can read them off yeah. to our podcast listeners. Supporter, motivator, photographer, trainer, food prepper, therapist, number one fan, coach, but most importantly, pageant mom. <laughs> yes, that's right. Adam Bo is also a pageant mom. That's my mom. most important job. I don't know about a food prepper though. I don't, I don't, no, don't I don't think food. I've ever prepped your food. Trifecta, my food. Yeah, <laughs> trifecta, that's trifecta's job. So, yeah, so we got a good one today. Mm-hmm. Actually, the the really the brain behind the bikini and the brain always comes up with the ideas. <laughs> what is this today's episode? So I thought we'd, we'd play a little game today. It's called Myth, Fact, or Partly True. Ooh. So I'm going to read you out some phrases, okay, some common um, phrases that you you hear within the discussion of fitness and health, and we can decide if they are fact, if they are myth, or if they are partly true. Yeah. So and these ones, way. guys, so you know, on this one. So today is Monday, and we're releasing this on Friday, and so we just recorded on last Friday, our last episode. So I didn't really get to see these. So this is like going to be yeah. a nice surprise. There's nothing pre-prepped for this. Yeah, putting then, them on the spot right yeah. now. <laughs> and then the other thing is, um, the reason that we're doing it on Monday is because Ashley, little Ashley is competing on mm-hmm. Friday. Saturday. So, Saturday. Yes. Saturday. Sorry. Mm-hmm. So that's exciting. I'm excited. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> so she's, she's feeling it a little bit right now. This is pretty much peak week. She's been, she's been carb free for a few oh, days. Yeah. I'm pushing it, man. I have never had a harder peak week. That's for sure. But I need it. I need it. Push through. Only a few more days left, left to go. Let's go. Woo. Um, okay. So let's get this party started. All right. The first one, Adam. Sodium will give you a good pump in the gym. True, myth, or partly true? You know what? Um, this one is partly true. Yeah. So here's the thing. Here's the thing with sodium. And you hear me talk about sodium a lot. So you have a hormone in your body that kind of regulates water retention called aldosterone, which is affected by how much sodium consumption you have past your normal amounts. So um, if you have, if you're eating like, let's say, and I'm just going to throw out, you know, regular, you know, arbitrary numbers out here, but let's say you eat 3000 milligrams of sodium a day. Well, that's your normal amount. So you're always going to have like the same amount of water retention in like 99% of the the cases, always have like the same amount of water retention. Um, But then if you one day eat 10,000 milligrams, let's say you had like a big salty meal and you're, you know, you're eating 10,000, you're going to have more water retention the next day because it's going to trigger your aldosterone and body's going to say, oh, we're eating a bunch of sodium. Let's hold on to some water. Um, with that, generally people think they get better pumps because they have more, well, you have more water retention you, and you also, people think you have more blood volume because the more water retention, the more blood volume, better pumps. It's not something that you should do, you should do regularly or anything like that. Um, But a lot of times it happens too where people think where the whole pump thing came from is backstage people will do it when they haven't had any sodium for a while and then they then they get some sodium and all of a sudden they start filling out and getting good pumps. Well, they they shouldn't have ever been in that state where they had no sodium and then they filled out and now they feel like they have regular pumps. So that's the that's Mm. the thing there too. So it's very rare where you'll cut someone's sodium. I mean, it's I have it. I do it with like there. I think right now I do it with like two people. It's like. This is this guy named Mers who's he it actually works for him. But the problem with him, when we get done with the shows, he blows Oh, I can up. imagine. Da- like to the point where it's we have to every time we do a show together, we talk about it. Like he's like, I'm like, you sure you want to do this? And he's like, it, it works for me. I want to do it. And I'm like, all right, just be careful with after your show because you're gonna blow up and he'll get water retention like maybe three weeks, but so bad the next day, the next couple days that like his sock lines are like, oh. they're not normal sock lines. Like, they're like, I'm like, I don't know, man. That's, they're that's, like what, yeah, it's like check your blood pressure and make sure your blood pressure doesn't get too high. Like, it's like a whole thing. Like, he takes, he'll take, um, like, expel after the show to try to keep the water retention down. Like, it's like a whole thing. So, not something I'd recommend. I think it's very, very rare where cutting sodium makes a difference, but there's 
you know, there is times. There are times. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, depends on the person, I guess. All right, the next one. Eating carbs past 7 p.m. will turn to fat. I, you know what? I don't hear this one as much as I used to, but this one used to be like a thing. This one used to be a thing. <laughs> this one's false, okay? But it used to be such a popular, like, um, like message. Yeah. Don't eat carbs past 7 p.m. or don't eat carbs two hours before you go to bed. Carbs just gonna be floating around, then go right to fat. It's not <laughs> really how it works. I mean, anything in, in excess is gonna, you know, any excess calories is likely to be stored as fat, but there isn't like a rule that, like, oh yeah, you have to wait. You have to wait uh, two hours then if you have carbs to go to bed. Like, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah. That one is, yeah, carbs don't have a bad time. So yeah, they don't. A, They're uh, nocturnal. <laughs> what's really funny is people have had that. There's like so many, you know, it's funny, especially like this year mm -hmm. has really, to me, is like exposed how many things people would just blanketly believe, you know what I mean? Because of the whole COVID situation. But like this year, it's just like, all, and then you start seeing these other little things that you could kind of be like, oh, I can see why people believe that because someone just said it, period. And like mm -hmm. no one ever even questioned it, you know? So like the com common sense would be like, well, what if I work till you know, what if I work the night shift and I work till 3 a.m.? Do I still not eat carbs? Like, like there's like, there's, it just doesn't make any sense, period, because everyone sleeps at different times, whatever. But um, at the end of the day, what matters is going to be calories in versus calories out. And that is really like mostly what matters. So it doesn't matter when you eat them. Um, they've done studies on it. They've done, they've done a couple of research things on like meal frequency, meal timing, and it is shown to be very, very like irrelevant to results and progress, like the meal frequency and timing. So I even tell people just eat whenever you want to eat, whenever you're hungry, eat, you know, it's, you don't, your meal plan might say six times a day, but if you're, you know, out and about all day long, you can only eat three times, just combine those meals and do it three times. It doesn't matter if you do it right when you get home and you have to eat three basically meals combined at late at night, right when you got home, cause you were out all day, whatever. It doesn't mm -hmm. really make that big of a difference over the grand scheme of things. So true, true that. All right, the next one. You don't have to lift heavy to put on muscle. So this is like the debate between like volume and a bunch of reps with short periods versus like maybe lifting super, super heavy with adequate rests between. What are your thoughts, Adam? Is it fact? Is it myth or partly true? Um, that's going to be another partly true one. If not, if more, leaning more towards the myth mm -hmm. that you don't need to lift heavy. Yeah, it's because here's the thing. When you're trying to build muscle, you gotta understand, you gotta like really think about, you gotta really think about these things because it's, first you gotta think about, okay, why would my body want to put on muscle, right? Well, it's counterintuitive to what the body wants to do. You don't wanna become hyper inefficient, you know? And that's what muscle does, is it makes you very inefficient at sustaining yourself because it eats up so many calories. So any metabolic tissue is, basically means that it burns calories. It's, that's a that's a tissue your body doesn't want to have more of because then now it's required to have more calories to sustain itself. So the body's not going to just want to do that, you know. There's very few like metabolic tissues that you could like add on to your body kind of thing. You know, you have brown fat, you have, you know, like organs and you have like, you have your, your lean mass and the body doesn't want to gain any, or skeletal muscle. But I just want to gain any skeletal muscle, but it doesn't need to. So the only reason it does that is that you are creating a stimulus of some type where it has to do that. So basically, the way I like to explain it is, if you, actually the way, an easy way to understand like building muscle is, if, you, if any of you have like a scar on your body somewhere, everyone has like a one scar somewhere, um, and you'll have like a little, the scar, like if you cut yourself, the scar will be, if you look at the skin of the scar, like the healed scar, the skin will be a little bit higher than your skin. It's like a little bump, like you'll feel a little bit of bump to it. And that's like a, a way of understanding overcompensation, right? So basically you cut yourself in that area and the body says, hey, next time I need to be prepared just in case that happens again, I'm going to overcompensate. And now the next time he does that to me, it's going to be a little harder for him to get through the skin. So that's what that scar is. It's a little bit more than before. So... Um, the same thing happens with muscle, right? You work out to a point where your body hasn't gone before and then the body will build muscle in preparation for you doing that to it again. So if you're lifting light weight that's not challenging the body to 
basically create that scar scenario, then no, you're not going to build muscle. You know, so you have to create a stimulus. Now, does it need to be heavy weight? Not necessarily. It has to be a stimulus. So let's say you do, the problem is, is that once you get to a certain point of reps, it's no longer lifting weights, it's cardio. Yeah. That's, that's the problem you run into. So they say at, um, past 25 reps becomes a aerobic activity and anything less than 25 reps is an anaerobic activity. So if I, so it's hard to, it's, it's kind of true because you technically did, you could build muscle doing 20 reps and that's not necessarily very heavy weight, but it has to be enough to challenge the body more than it has gone through before mm -hmm. in order to create a stimulus that it needs to adapt to. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the whole thing with bodybuilding is you, so more times than not to build muscle, you're going to have to lift heavy. Especially if you're talking like, you know, like big Rammy, Phil Heath kind of muscle. Like you're trying to get big, big. Like those guys That's aren't what I'm lifting. I'm trying to do, you know. <laughs> yeah, those... I'm trying to get on big Rammy's <laughs> level. Like those guys are lifting loads, like lifting loads. And if you're like a small ectomorph bikini competitor who's has a real hard time building muscle, you might want to look at how heavy you're lifting. You might want to look at the intensity of what you're lifting. Like, are you actually lifting to the point where your body would need to compensate for that for the next time? Or are you just kind of lifting and going through the motions and like, you know, and that happens here all the time too. Like with people like, well, you're going to work at, you're going to train someone right now, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And, um, so just so you guys know, if you ever want to Ashley trains here at CPC, hit her up. Las Vegas. <laughs> but what will happen is I'll have people that'll be like, yeah, I work out hard. I work out hard. I work out hard. Right. All this stuff. Right. And then I'll take them, they'll come here and train with me and they won't last like 40 minutes. I'm mm. like, what were you doing? Their idea of intensity was yeah. totally off. <laughs> exactly, right? They, I mean, some of them it's like 20 and they're, they're like toast. And I'm like, this isn't, this is the level of what you need to be doing for what your goals are. If your goals aren't, you know, these are the people that tell me I want to be, the people who come like that make a trip out here and whatever, these are the people that say, I want to be the next Olympian, right? And I'm like, you're not even close. Like mm. you, your work ethic isn't there yet, you know? So mm -hmm. like, yeah, those, if you want to do that, if you want to be that girl, or if you want to get to your results exponentially faster than most everyone else, the intensity, there's going to have to be some load. You're going to have to fail. You're going to have to be uncomfortable. You're going to have to push it. You know, you're not going to do it most likely with 20 reps because your intensity is probably not going to be there. The problem with 20 reps is like, you don't really fail at 20 reps. You could probably do 22. You could probably do 24 That's if you pushed it, you know? With eight, 12 reps, sometimes even 15, like, but mostly like eight, 12, like you can't do 13. That means the body is like, okay, last time Adam did 100 pounds 10 times, and that was all I could do. Well, this time Adam did 105 pounds 10 times. I need to now get ready for that, you know, and that's how you build more muscle. So hopefully that was actually pretty cool to go into because I think people need to understand that because so much of it happens in the gym. And when I'm changing menu plans, like all the time, because that's what I do all day long, I change menu plans and stuff. The people who work out hardest change their menu plans the least mm. because their intensity is creating the calories being burned, the recovery is creating the calories mm -hmm. burned. And I know it because I, I know the people who are working hard usually, like not all the time because it's you know mostly online, but sometimes I like see them in their stories and how they're actually working and their menu plans don't change very often, you know, because they're, their body's like, that's not enough calories for their body, how hard they're working, right? If anything, sometimes they go up. Some, you know, a lot of times they go down in prep, but sometimes they're like, you'll see them start going up because they're getting more muscle. Mm -hmm. So, but the people who are constantly changing their menu plans, constantly changing it, they're just not, a lot of times they're just not working hard enough. Not every time, but a lot of times. Mm. And so the, the stimulus isn't there. They're not getting that metabolic effect post-workout. They're not getting those extra calories um, burned with, because recovery is not necessary as much. Um, and they're not burning a lot of calories in the gym, period, you know, mm -hmm. so anyway, that was a long one, but I think that's an important one. No, yeah. it's very important, and this is what the public needs. <laughs> the public needs more Adam Boney <laughs> spitting them facts through the screen. Oh, well, thank you. You know? <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so the next one. Fasted cardio is superior to non-fasted. Now, this one is partly true because there's an exception tricky. that I remember you telling me yeah, about. It's tricky. There is an exception, like a very small exception, yeah. but still an exception. But it's it's false for the most part, mm -hmm. or we can say mostly mostly false. <laughs> um, but the I I like to do fast cardio, and I think it helps me, but not in the way you guys would think. Yeah. Um. So basically, if I were to do cardio fasted. 
it just prolongs my eating window. And let's say I wake up at five and go to bed at nine, you know, and let's say I do cardio first, then I won't probably eat till like after cardio, um, maybe sometime around like nine or something. Whereas if I didn't do fasted cardio, my eating window would start out smaller. Now, if you're able to condense your calories into the smaller window, um, or if you're able to, I guess, eliminate some calories by essentially skipping a meal, um, then you can burn fat that way, but it's not necessarily like um, you're gonna start burning fat faster because you're fasted, except for the one exception. And did I word that correctly, by the way? Yeah. Is that easy to understand? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so we'll go into the whole fasted scenario too. And so this is another one of those things where I talk about all the time where research isn't done on the subjects that we want them to be done mm -hmm. on, right? So data is not, I would say is not completely conclusive on this. There's been a couple studies on it, but the studies don't really apply to a bodybuilder who's a week out from the clash, who's super carb depleted already. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. It's, it's again, it's the same grouping. Again, it's the same people. It's college kids who are probably out drinking the weekend before who are super full of carbohydrates. Their glucose stores are great. They have, their glycogen stores are great. They're, you know, so yeah, the effect on them is going to be less in a study than someone who's completely depleted. Mm -hmm. If someone was completely depleted of, of glycogen, would they burn more fat? I don't, you know, I don't have the, the type of lab to mm -hmm. test that. So, you know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. So right now, with all the studies that are done, which I've seen, there's there's two of them. They both have shown um, results being pretty much the same, fasted mm -hmm. or fed cardio. So that's what we could go off of in terms of like data, which is the most important thing. But the case group isn't the case group we wanted to go off of. So the theory is when you're um, when your glucose depleted and you're all depleted down, that if you don't have any carbohydrates or any energy stores or any food in the system that you will burn more fat when you f first wake up by doing like low intensity steady state cardio and steady state cardio you do you do burn more fat calories than if you were to do hit cardio during the session but after the session you burn significantly less calories so after the session of steady state cardio you don't burn any calories like in an afterburn reason you know an afterburn mm -hmm. with um hit cardio you burn less calories within the session um because generally the sessions are low, lower duration because it's so intense mm -hmm. and you burn a lot less fat calories because your body can't use fat at that rapid of a pace. And then after it, you burn more calories because your body's recovering from the actual workout. So that's where the whole thing comes in. So steady state, because you use a higher percentage of fat during low intensity workout, you actually burn the most amount of fat calories per, uh, most amount of per, the highest percentage of fat calories doing the least amount of things. So if you're sleeping, you burn the highest amount of calories from fat at that time. Oh, wouldn't you know? Yeah, because- I need to sleep more. The, the, well, it's, it's, it's de that's the problem is it's, it's deceptive. Like you can take all these things and take to, to fit your argument, you know, all the, you know, all the way. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing is the, the less you're moving, the easier it is for your body to use fat as a source of energy easier the faster you're moving it has to um, use different things you know I see, I see. Mm -hmm. you know when we talked about like the atp energy cycle type of thing mm -hmm. so you know when, once once you're moving at that fast of a pace like you're going to be using glucose that's the way to do it so your body's taking glycogen out so the theory is okay you do steady state cardio your glycogen depleted you're going to use a higher percentage of calories from fat and because no energy stores are available you have to use even higher percentage of energy stores from fat i don't i've never seen it where it made sense where that was significantly a benefit especially if you're doing two sessions a day like you're doing your cardio session then you go home and you work out i think that the burnout on that is significantly greater impact than the small benefit if there is any benefit at all from the fasted cardio mm -hmm. two sessions a day of cardio will burn someone out of this industry so fast like competing you want to compete but then every time you got to work out for two hours two separate times a day like no one's going to do that you know so not long term, maybe your first show would be exciting and you're going to go in and do your fasted cardio, wake up, go take a shower, go to work, come back to the gym, do another cardio session. Like maybe you'll do that your first couple shows and you're like, no, it's cool. I love it. But very rarely, and people do make it out where they keep doing shows and shows like that, but very rarely do they make it past like three shows because it's so life altering. You know, it's so like, that's your life. That's it. That's all you do is work out. You know, relationships get ruined. 
like everything, it's just hard, you know? Yeah. So it's unnecessary to do it. Um, is there a benefit to it? Not that I've seen. I say do it fasted or do it fed. It's just up to you. Like, like if you're, um, if like, you're going to do it fasted, like the only benefit would be ex if you're in extreme depletion, basically, right? Potentially. That's the potential if, benefit. If there was, if a there benefit. was, yes, okay. exactly. A potential. So you'd have to be like glucose depleted because yeah. the problem is, is you're not, you're not going to be like, like 12 weeks out and be at that state yet. No, you shouldn't be. I mean, you, you shouldn't would, be that glycogen yeah, depleted. Maybe like, if anything, like the week of or something. Yeah. Like when you're, when show. you're really feeling it, the last yeah. Like I don't crash anyone I mean, unless depending I, on how their diet is yeah, too. I don't crash anyone hard until like, if I need to, it'll be like four weeks, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe like rarely like and six weeks. And that's because they're not where right. they need to be. And know? to be glycogen depleted, you'd have to like basically do very low carb diet, you know? So yeah. this only applies to, if it were to work, to very low carb diet people. Cause the, yeah, cause the theory is the glucose stores mm -hmm. are depleted. So yeah. So in order for that theory to even work, they have to be depleted. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And the, the problem is too, is like, if you're doing a super high carbohydrate or super high protein diet, you're probably not that glucose depleted as you think, because if you're doing a high pro super high protein di diet, your body can convert proteins to carbohydrates mm -hmm. through this process called gluconeogenesis. And it'll basically, can, you can still have good energy stores because of that. So you're still mm -hmm. not depleted. So it's like, it's hard to get depleted, you know, and, um, in the body, out, out in these streets, it's now. hard in these depleted streets, mm -hmm. <laughs> these, carbohydrate, I know. these carbohydrate gangs from the South, these carbohydrate <laughs> gangs from the North, they, uh, yeah, no, the, um, you know, the, it's, it's, uh, it's not the easiest scenario. So now the scenario that, that there is a real benefit in is where there is enhancements done, like performance enhancing drugs. That's the only time where I could be like, okay, for sure it's probably better then. Like, well, for sure it's probably better. That's like it's still is not as sure as I am. And that's when like you get these, you know, top level guys, bodybuilders. It's never like, bikini athletes don't do this stuff. So like we're talking them doing like, um, there's this, there's things out there like growth hormones and things called FRAG that like basically help your body use fat at a faster rate. Um, and then they do things like clenbuterol and thyroid. And then, yeah, you do all that and you basically modify your internal workings for periods of time. Mm -hmm. And then you do fasted cardio for, you could probably do it for like two hours because you're on so many, so much gear that you're not going to lose any muscle. And that's when you create these scenarios that are like, oh yeah, do fasted cardio. And that's where, that's where you run into the problem where bodybuilders have a really hard time preparing bikini competitors. And you, you don't see it too often where there's like a really good bodybuilder preparing really good bikini competitors. It's very, very rare. And the reason is, is that they use that, science right they're what mm -hmm. they would do for bodybuilders and then they try to apply it to a bikini competitor and i'm like no <laughs> they're not doing those things so they you have to take a different approach because you're turning people into superhumans and then taking a superhuman approach which in any other scenario would cause like if i said hey ashley you do two hours of cardio a day in the morning fasted she would lose her legs her glutes her everything because she doesn't have any of those enhancements i would just be a torso you'd be a torso yeah you'd just be a torso you'd be stick and bone you'd have no muscle because you'd eat it all away so like you and that's the problem and then hopefully that's like a light switch for some of you guys out there because if you're using a bodybuilder a hardcore bodybuilder's approach to a bikini prep but you're not taking any of the hardcore bodybuilder drugs of course it's going to work differently of course it's designed completely differently and so that's where you run into this like this bridge of two different two people doing the same thing mm -hmm. but you have to do two different completely different styles right. because of because of the the superhuman aspect of it right you 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 take all those hormones, you turn someone into a superhuman. They, they can do different things, you know, so. They can fly. I saw somebody fly outside, I saw, I, 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 outside of a, a competition he was, once. He was big, too. Yeah, he flew <laughs> home. Like, he didn't even need to get in the field, but he just flew home because he got those superhuman powers. You know what I mean? Know? They burn fat faster. They hold on to muscle easier. They lift heavier weight. They, they could fly. jump higher. They could, yeah, they could. I saw one. He just walked through a wall. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. This, you just. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's when you know. That's when you know <laughs> something's you know. performance. They're taking something. They call it performance enhancing to a reason. <laughs> so Better so be yeah. careful because some of them get laser vision too. So <laughs> yeah. just be careful. You I heard know? Cyclops was on a bunch of juice. Wear underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Science. <laughs> Um, coming from a personal <laughs> standpoint with fasted cardio, I always get asked if I do fasted cardio. And the answer is yes and no. So, like, here's my thoughts on it. If I wake up and I'm not hungry, I'll do cardio. 
I'll just go right to cardio. You know why? I just want to get over with. And why eat if I'm not hungry? I never like to eat if I'm not hungry. I don't like to force feed myself. I will get hungry later. Don't you worry. But like, I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, I got to consume this meal for cardio. Um, but 90% of the time, I'm, st- I'm hungry when I wake up or I could use a little snack or something. So usually I'll have like, um, you know, small little meal before cardio. Um, that way I'm not distracted by like cravings or hunger or anything like that. So a lot of people out there are kind of like just, you know, making it miserable for themselves and maybe they wake up starving and they're like, oh no, but I got to do cardio first before I eat. But maybe they're not pushing themselves as much as they could because they don't have the energy for it and because they're like focused on hunger. Does that make sense? So even if there is a small benefit, probably not a benefit at all, but even if there was one, it's probably um, not as beneficial as like going to do cardio when you're not um, starving or anything, you know, because that that can be very distracting for people. It's like, oh my God, I can't even push myself because I'm just starving, you know? So it's my thoughts on it. Yeah, no, um... I would agree with that 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because if you're one of those people, because some people don't even care. You know, they just like, they don't, they don't really feel it. But yeah, mm-hmm. if you're one of those people, it'll ruin your workout. Your intensity will be down. You're thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say, you know, make it, I try to make this as life, norm, like as normal life as possible. Because people, I think people think prep has to be so crazy. And it really doesn't, it doesn't need to be. For sometimes it, sometimes it, sometimes it has to be. Because there's sometimes it's just the way it is. But for the most part, it doesn't need to be like as crazy as we make it to be because it really is just losing fat. You know, that's all prep is, is losing fat. People think it's like, oh, no, I'm prepping and it's like totally different. Like, no, it's just losing fat. And if you continue to lose fat at the rate of which will have you lean enough come showtime, then you don't need to change anything. You just need to keep losing fat. That's it. It's just like a normal person's diet. Now, when you're trying to get ultra, ultra lean and your body starts fighting you towards the end, that's when things get a little bit crazy, but it's pretty, it's pretty mild until that point. You know, it's pretty much just a normal diet. Lose for a bikini competitor, lose one and a half pounds, one pound a week of fat, and whatever it takes to do that, that's it. You don't need to go do fasted cardio, eat no carbs, do 600 calories. Like, you're just losing fat. That's it. So, like, think about it like that, and then, you know, if you're struggling towards the end when you get down to, like, 14% and you're trying to get to 13%, yeah, it gets hard there. You might need to go a little crazy, but you don't. You definitely don't need to do it the first, like, 70% of a prep, for the mm-hmm. most part. For the most part. There are people out there that are tough, but not all of them. Yeah, see, prep can be fun. It isn't I'm a... having the time of my life. Yeah. It's peak week, and I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> just a little time. And yeah, just to get, <laughs> you know, just to preface this right, Ashley's doing a show Saturday, but by the time we release this, it'll be two days after her show. Oh, yeah, so, so I would either, yeah. So I guess we'll I... see, you know, how it goes, <laughs> so hopefully you did hopefully you did well ashley yeah, see, <laughs> ashley this is to ashley in the future i still love you ashley no matter what <laughs> she, that's my note to ashley in the future okay <laughs> that is all okay next up not all calories are equal so kind of going back to the phrase calories in calories out which you mentioned earlier yeah. And I know you kind of, you said there was like a little little There's exception to, to that. There's tricks to this. So yeah. I'm going to say that is a false, and here's why. Yeah, there's. This is going to be a controversial one because the the science guys would be like, no, calories are calorie calorie in calorie out, right? Kinda, yeah. <clears throat> if you were to if you were to get a calorie in the body and it was one calorie one calorie in the body, then yes, that's the same. But calories, the way that we think of calories, we think of them externally out of the body. That's how mm-hmm. we, all, we all measure our calories externally. We don't measure them internally. And so a calorie on a plate versus a calorie on a plate, yes, same thing. I get that. And this is my argument for the macro dieting people. And I've, um, and I've stayed true to this argument for a long time. Um, so here's the thing. Let's, let's talk about the calorie thing because it's important and people want to understand um, why they can't eat pizza on prep or why they can't do this, right? So first off, macro dieting was never designed to be, even the people who created macro dieting never designed it to be where you're eating pizza and Pop-Tarts and things like that. It was never designed like that. Okay, macro dieting started on bodybuilding.com 
when we had no information out back in like 1998, when no one had any information, no Google, no YouTube, no one answered these questions. So we'd go to these boards, these bodybuilding.com boards, and they'd have top guys in there, really top guys that are now they're big names. They used to just be top like bloggers and stuff. Like you look at like, you'd have like um, just big names in there. I mean, really there's like, like a lot of the big names you know of now that are like nutrition sciences guys were in there, in there. That's where they started in bodybuilding.com on the boards. And so they'd ask someone, some top guy, hey, I'm doing a show. Can I eat, you know, a banana or a strawberries or will it ruin my prep? Because li- we had such little information that it was common to think if I had a banana, it might ruin my prep. <laughs> like that's how little information we had back then. It's crazy to think of now because now everyone's like, that's so ridiculous, right? Mm-hmm. But back then it's like, oh, I don't want to ruin my prep, right? So I, gotta, I can only eat tilapia and I can only eat asparagus and I can only eat a sweet potato post-workout. That's all I could do. That's it. Whole prep. And so then these guys are like, yeah, if, it's in, if it fits in your macros, eat it. Yeah, it's fine. Eat it, right? And everyone's like, oh, freedom, right? Freedom. And then you had, of course, you always have one group. It takes everything to the extreme. Let's just fit your macros, right? Fit your macros. So it turned into like, if it, because it wasn't even IFYM. It was like, if it fits your macros, if it fits your macros, whatever that is. If it, I, I, F, maybe that, no, that's a new one. It wasn't, it was different. It was like, it's, it was less. It was less than IFYM. It turned into something else, but it started off something differently. And they, they ended up like putting an acronym up one time and then that became a thing and then they added the IFYM. So anyway, it was never intended. Even the guys who say, who created it, still say it was not intended to be the way it's being used now. It's not how it was worked, how, how we described it, you know? So, okay, let's go into, okay, well, why does it matter? Calories are calorie, Adam. It doesn't matter. That's what the macro diet's based on, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay, yes, that's kind of true. It is kind of true. I could see the argument for it. The problem what they don't take into account is that when we are doing contest prep, we are looking at major data collection. That's all it is. It's data collection and it's, okay, Ashley's getting ready for the clash this, this weekend. Okay, her calories plus her cardio plus her workouts plus her supplements should equal this result, right? If Ashley doesn't reach this result, I need to change one of those four parameters so I can elicit that result. I'm using a micro progression system, so I'm only going to change something within about a 10% margin. So that way we can progress it for long periods without like crashing all the way through Mm -hmm. because then your body's going to adapt way too much, right? And you probably even halt your progress. So, okay, taking that into account, now you got to look at the calories, which is the number one factor. More than anything is important is calories. So you have yourself, you're eating, let's say you're eating a macro-based diet and you're just eating all these different foods all the time and the, the foods themselves, like if you look at like fast food, or whatever, the data reporting on that is off by a significant amount, significant amount, more, more than the 10% margin of error that I need, right? So if you have, let's say a Chick-fil-A sandwich and you're using MyFitnessPal and you're using a user database input and it's not Chick-fil-A's input and it's just some user and you're just using theirs and they're off by 20% because they're estimating it. Maybe they didn't look it up and they just put it in for their own personal thing, but you use that one. Well, now you're off by who knows how much percent. Plus, the burger itself or the Chick-fil-A sandwich itself is going to be varying amounts each time. It's not, they're not like, per, some kid in the back isn't precisely weighing yeah. and measuring and ketchuping and all this, whatever they do there. Like, it's going to be different, Ketchup. right? <laughs> right? So, so then you have that variable. But then the biggest variable you have is net calories based on thermic effect of food. So the thermic effect of food is how many calories it takes for your body to digest any particular food. Okay, so if you eat broccoli, broccoli has a very high thermic effect. So that means that to digest broccoli, 100 calories of digesting broccoli is a lot of that broccoli's calories. So if you have 100 calories from broccoli, it's roughly 40 calories of that broccoli it takes to digest that 100 calories. So therefore, you're left with 60 net calories where your body is going to be able to like actually do something with. The other 40 has to be used to digest it. It can't do anything else besides digest those calories. Right, so 60 calories, right? So what if you drink 100 calories of orange juice? On paper, they're both carbohydrates. They both are the same, right? So 100 calories of orange juice, it takes your body probably two calories to digest. So you have 98 available calories. So though you had 100 calories of each on two different food groups, the net calories available was 60 and 98. So 38 more calories from one food, right? So that's why... Uh, yes, a calorie is a calorie once it's past its point of digestion, mm-hmm. I would say. But prior to that, on a plate, it's when you look at it, when we all do our tracking, 
and we're never going to be able to track thermic effect of foods because it's going to be different for different people. Mm -hmm. But um, that's why I'm very particular on food types, yes. you know, and it's better for your, your gut mm -hmm. health. It's better if you're trying to do this like at the high levels, like you got to have, you got to make sure that your gut health is great. You got to be eating foods that are digested well with your system. You got to be doing all these things um, because if not, you know, you're having, let's say you're eating a bunch of gluten and that's, your body doesn't agree with it. You're going to have distension. You're going to have, you know, constant inflammation that you're fighting. Your gut health isn't going to be ideal. And you're saying, oh, I want to be the best and you want to compete against the best with that going on. Unlikely that you're going to be able to do that when the other people who are also genetically gifted are taking those variables into account and you're going against them thinking that you could just overcome this right. major, this major um, holdup that's, that's getting you to be your best. You know, mm -hmm. it's just not possible. So, so that's my long way of explaining it, but it's, it's valid and in prep it matters. Now, if you're just like a, someone who needs to lose 40 pounds and you want to do an IFYM diet, go for it. You're going to have varying days of calories. They're going to be off by whatever. Go for it. Have fun. I'm not saying don't do it ever. I'm just saying your goals, your actions have to match your goals and you need data to get you, mm -hmm. in order to like adjust someone's plan, you need data. Right. That's, and it, it makes it very hard mm -hmm. for data reasons. So, right. I mean, even going beyond like the macros, um, just even the basic calorie itself, like you don't, <laughs> you don't see like professional bodybuilders like just prepping with cotton candy you know what yeah. i mean like can you imagine how i would look <laughs> if i just you know forget about the chicken and veggies let's do cotton candy yeah like um 1500 calories worth of cotton candy can you imagine what i would look like i would not look the same regardless yeah. so even like nailing down the macros and figuring that out is one thing but it, this the calorie itself you know because i think whenever you speak macros you're talking to fitness people but like for the mainstream people they probably think like oh yeah there's a 200 calories of cotton candy I have, or I can have like, you know, breakfast sandwich or something. Yeah. So it's like, there's so much of a difference. And every macro would have a different duty, correct? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Everyone so, has a different duty. They have, they have a job. Yeah. And it's funny because like, you'll usually get people who have not been successful in the industry as like a coach or an athlete are the ones promoting this type of thing, this type of diet, like mm -hmm. for people who want to be successful in the industry. And I'm like, you guys, you got to <laughs> correlate that math. Like if, the, it's, if they're not successful, they've never prepped anyone that's successful. They've never won an Olympia title. They've never prepped everyone to, to even get there. How can they give you the information that they're right and everyone else is wrong, right? It doesn't make sense. You know, mm -hmm. like it, that's, it doesn't make any sense. That's why people are like always like, and I always tell them, okay, if, if macro diet, macro diet has been around over 20 years. If it works so well and there was no disadvantage, how come we have yet to see a Mr. or Miss Olympia on a macro IFYM diet? Yeah, maybe in the off season, but definitely not, pro not conscious prep. prepping. Still haven't seen it, yeah. right? 20 not years, that I know of. we have how many titles? There's seven titles, you know, eight titles now with wellness, I think, of, of, of um, divisions. So we have eight times 10 or times 20, right? Mm -hmm. So we have um, over the course of two decades, we've had 160 different titles passed out. I mean, there's divisions have come and not and still not one has gotten a Olympia title, and and if if, there, if there's no disadvantage whatsoever, how come they haven't got it? Like let's just go off that map. Don't show me your science books. Don't show me your research. How come evidence has shown, based on the people who are winning, if there's no difference, how come they haven't done it yet? You know, it's not like they haven't tried it. I'm sure these guys have tried. It. Who doesn't want to eat pizza for prep? Mm -hmm. I would. <laughs> <I'd>, Y'all. <laughs> so it just doesn't it just doesn't seem to work the same way. You know mm -hmm. so. All right, next up, if you're not sore the next day, you didn't train hard enough. I love being sore. <laughs> just let, I was putting that out there. I love being sore. <laughs> it's like very satisfying feeling. It's like it hurts so good. And um, that's, I mean, it's false, but I still like being sore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I still like being sore. Yeah, it's false. And it, a lot of it comes down to your recovery mm -hmm. ability. The longer you work out, the more years you put in the gym, the less likely it is that you're going to be able to be um, so your body's going to be just better at recovering. Just like you get better at everything, your body gets better at recovering. You know, if you see like, if you went and did a blacksmith's job for one day, you'd be beat up. The next day you'd be so sore. But like, I work out all the time and I play hockey now. So my body's getting better now where it used to be. And like, I'm not, I'm, uh, you know, so I'm pretty functional at this point. But if I go and paint a wall, <laughs> the next day I'll be lit up. Like my yeah. lower back will hurt, my shoulders will hurt. Like, and I'm like, why, why does that do that to me? Well, it's something different that I haven't been doing, you know, painting or something, you know, like, or, 
or moving furniture that's not even heavy, like lighter furniture, just moving it around all day long, like when I'm putting the, putting the gym together and stuff. I'm like, it doesn't, it should, it doesn't make sense why it would hurt me. Well, I haven't been doing that. So yeah, I get sore and I get beat up from it and I get micro trauma, right? And that's where your soreness comes in. So yeah, if you've been working out for 10 years and you have a good arm workout and, you might, and you're not that sore the next day, it's not a bad thing. Your body's just really good at recovering, you know? You might not have worked out that hard, probably, you know? Mostly, if you work out really, really hard, you're still gonna get sore no matter what. But I guess if you worked out really, really hard every single time, you probably wouldn't the next time either. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not really a good sign. Remember, the body only builds muscle when, it's, when there's a stimulus. So if you create any type of stimulus um, that the body hasn't done before, that's when it's gonna build muscle. It got, does it through mechanical tension. It's not like, it's not about being sore. That's not the direct correlating sign with building muscle. True. So. I just like, I just like it. Yeah. And I like, uh, like if my legs are sore, I was like poking my quad, like, yeah. ow, that hurts, but I'm still poking it. Like, <laughs> I don't know why. It's, a, you, it's, it's like, like a, oh, hey, what's up? It's like a, it's like an A on a, on a report card. Yeah. Right? It's what it is. It's like, oh, I, I, I got a good oh, workout the other day. Yeah. Here's my grade. I'm sore, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to look at yeah. it. Um, okay. So next up is you can make gains while in a calorie deficit. Is this a fact? Is this a myth or partly true? It's um, fully true. Yeah, fully, fully true. true. Yeah, you can make You a... heard it first. <laughs> heard yeah, it first. People, people think you can't build muscle in a, caloric, um, in a caloric deficit. You can't build muscle, right? That's always what you hear. No, you need to be in a caloric surplus because your body needs calories and, and you, need, you need extra calories than you burn in order to add on muscle, right? Well... Not really, um, and, that's been, and that's been proven quite a few times, actually. So here's the thing. Your body is going to build muscle. You, how, how do I explain this? Make it simple. The, the sim, this is a very hard answer to answer. But, okay, the simplest way of explaining this, your body needs to, your body's first goal is to survive. That's the first goal. So if you are thinking about pure survival and you're not eating that many calories because you're in, like, um, let's say it's, 200 years ago and there's not that much food available, but you need to run X amount of miles in order to catch food. Do you think your body's just gonna say, we're just not gonna let him run and so he can't have enough muscle because we're not gonna let him run and so he starves to death? Or we're gonna say, body's gonna say, oh, let's find a way to make him run. Let's build a little bit more muscle so we can go get that food, right? So the body is smarter than we like give it credit for. It's an incredible machine. It was the best machine ever made, right? Heck yeah, it was. <laughs> so thanks, mom and dad. Yeah, I know, right? It's a, it's a, it's an incredible, incredible working machine that we still haven't figured out. So here's the thing: if you're not, if your body, you know, you're you're building. Remember, you're, while you're building muscle, we talked about it earlier. You're building muscle to basically survive what you're doing to it. You're to to keep it going for what you're doing to it. The body doesn't know that you're trying to build muscle when you're lifting 100 pound dumbbells. It just knows it's lifting a lot of weight and it doesn't know why and it needs to be prepared for that. So if you are, let's say you're eating a, a caloric deficit, but you're still lifting really hard weights and you're lifting hard, the body still has to be prepared for that. It doesn't like it goes away. It's not like it goes away because your calories aren't there. It's not like the need is any less. It still recognizes the fact that I'm lifting all this stuff and if I just start losing muscle, I'm not going to be able to lift all this stuff. And I don't know what he's doing out there. <laughs> Maybe he's saving lives and lifting cars off people. I don't know. Maybe he's lifting it off himself to serve survival purely. We need to be able to do that. That's a, he's telling me I need to be able to do that. So because of that, I'm cre he's creating a stimulus. He's not eating that many calories. It's okay. I still have fat calories. I'm going to shift some of those calories I'm getting in that he's eating. And I'm going to use those to recover this muscle and build some muscle. And even though I don't have that many calories available to me, I'm just gonna use more of these calories that I have stored for the energy for everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's a calorie shifting, right? Um, so you're eating calories are going towards muscle, even though you don't have the calories. And so you, in, in theory, you're kind of shifting to further caloric deficit internally because you're using fat energy to use for the rest of your energy. And you're actually creating a stimulus, which is using the calories that you're, you're consuming. So it's actually a really good scenario, but it's harder. Is it harder for the body to do it that way? Yes. Can you do it that way? Yes. Are the net results different for someone who's bulking and someone gaining? And I would say the results are the same. Uh, lean gaining or bulking um, or even caloric deficit. And I could go into that a little bit. With, but I feel like when I talk about these without like graphs, it gets a little lost. But I'm going to try. Let's go into, okay, that real quick. Um, if someone, 
books, let's just do it easy. If someone books and they gain, 10, let's say they gain 10 pounds and then they gain three pounds of muscle and they gain seven pounds of fat and that's very normal, that's a very normal amount. It actually is probably less muscle than that, but that's a very normal amount of like fat gained. And then someone caloric deficit gained, right? Where they gained only one pound of muscle, but no fat, or they did it at maintenance and they gained no fat. They didn't lose much fat. Maybe they lost a little fat. Um, let's say they lost a little bit of fat because it was caloric deficit, but they gained one pound of lean mass. Okay, so some guy, one guy gained three pounds of lean mass, which is better than guy gained one pound of lean mass, but this guy who gained three pounds of lean mass still has to lose seven pounds of fat. The guy who gained one pound has to lose no fat. So how does that play in, right? Which one's superior? Well, this guy who, has to, who hasn't gained any fat and actually lost fat, guess what he gets to keep doing? He gets to keep going. He yes. gets to keep gaining because he's not worried about losing seven pounds of fat now, right? Yeah. So therefore, his period of gaining is a longer period of time, even though he's at maintenance calories, gaining very slowly. The guy who gains seven pounds of fat now needs to lose that seven pounds of fat. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when you lose seven pounds of fat? Well, you're going to lose some of that newly gained muscle too, that lean mass, because you're in an extreme caloric deficit now to lose that. The longer you diet, the more cardio you do, the more likely it is you're going to be losing some, some lean mass. And I would also so, add too, is like whenever you are in that state of like, I got to get lean, that kind of sometimes takes priority over like your lifts now because... It's like, oh, no, I, I got to put my energy towards cardio. I got to put my energy towards losing some weight rather than gaining muscle. Yeah. So that becomes difficult, too, when you try to prep because it's like, I, I mean, I don't know about you, Adam, but like if I have like a cardio and a lift on the same day, one of them will have priority, right? Yeah. And if it's if it's like, oh, man, I got to get lean, it's going to be cardio. Cardio first thing in the morning gets the priority. It gets my energy. And then by you know, a little bit later and I lift, some, sometimes I won't have as, as much energy because I already kind of spent it. Yeah. So, yeah, so when you're talking about now, it's funny because this argument, it kind of like, I can argue myself on it because of what I just said. Because I just said, oh, you, you, you could like, Adam, you just said that you can gain muscle in caloric deficit. So why is the guy who needs to lose seven pounds losing any muscle at all? Well, he's going to have to diet harder and for longer periods of time. And so because of that, anytime you go more extreme, it's going to be more likely that you lose more lean mass. The guy who lean gained, he's dieting very close to maintenance calories. So he's not like in a very extreme deficit, if any at all. You know, he's at a very minute deficit. So over the long period of time, he gains an adequate amount of muscle. He maybe loses just a little bit of body fat, but he's not gaining any body fat. That's the, that's the goal there, the, the key there. And if, he's, and if he's lean enough, he's just at maintenance calories, so he's not gaining any body fat. And he's kind of getting pretty good gains. But the guy who bulks, the net difference, the net end result is about the same there's no real difference because at the end the guy who gained the three pounds ends up losing a couple pounds and now he has one pound but he had a more extreme way of getting there you know maybe some people like it better maybe he got that guy who bulk got to eat a little bit more food maybe you want to do that um, but just know it's not superior it's i would say it's inferior um, in terms of like because of the the mental aspect of it too so um, because then you're you know you have you you lose your cuts you know, half Don't the year, the more than half the year, a lot of these guys. So, but then at the same time, you, I, I, don't, I don't know, a lot of times I see people diet and they diet off all their new muscle. I, I see it it's happen all the time. the thing. Because those are the extreme people and they like bulk extreme and then they diet extreme and then they gain a lot and then they lose a lot. And it's like, they, they end up just trying to transform and get the same physique they put on the last time with very little improvements. And then they'll post like a picture of like their before and after of like, their show to show and you're like trying to zoom in and see any difference that they made and they're like I'm like what did you do in the last two years because I don't see any difference yeah. on your physique and the guys who are lean gaining like you can see it you know you could usually see it better mm -hmm. um all the time you know so yeah I'm into that wow I'm a, I'm a lean gainer guy for lean sure lean gainer that's what's up super rare that I'll have someone like I actually don't ever have anyone bulk I mean, I'll have girls that eat a I lot mean, of calories. unintentionally bulk, maybe. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I'll have girls that eat a ton of calories because their metabolism dictates that, but mm -hmm. not not like, okay, we're going to purposely gain fat in order to gain muscle. Right. When that's just going to make your dieting phase way harder and than necessary. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. So and I've, I've said this before. There's never been an ounce of muscle gained because an ounce of fat was gained. Those two do not correlate in any way. So you do yeah. not need to gain fat to gain muscle. Good sound bite right there. Yeah. <laughs> good quotes. Words to live by. <laughs> All right, next up. You cannot spot reduce fat. That's so true. You can't. I'm sorry, guys. I'm so sorry to break it to you. It's disappointing, right? 
Yeah. I still get that question so much, so, so, so much. Like, Ashley, how, how do I remove the fat from my thighs? What exercises should I be doing? And the answer is you just got to, you know, be patient because it's, um, everyone's genetics are different. So everyone's going to lose fat in different places at a different time. So it's like, you know, for me, my abs can get leaner than my other body parts. And then the last to go would be my glutes. Um, but it's not like I can just say, well, since um, my glutes aren't lean enough, I just got to keep working them out and working them out. That's not really going to work. But what sometimes can happen is you can put on a little bit of muscle there, which will make it look more 3D, which might give the appearance that you're leaner in that area, although you're not. But it's not like you're just going to be able to choose where to lose the weight, you know? Yeah. So I would say it's it's false without any medical intervention. Well, no, it's true. Wait. Because my question was you or statement you cannot spot reduce. Fat. Oh, true. Then. Yes, <laughs> true. I'm true. sorry. They said you can't. You can't. Okay. Yeah. True. Without Thanks, any medical. True. Without any medical uh, intervention like you liposuction. liposuction. Um, the liposuction and um, that like that sculpting thing they do now, um, which I've I've actually looked into a little bit and it. I don't, you know, I would like to see more data on it, but it, from what I've seen, it shows that there could be some positive effect on it too. Is it like the, the cool um, sculpting or whatever it is? Oh, yeah. cool sculpting. I think that's the one it was. I looked into oh. if it's something. I don't do this with my athletes ever because you just got to diet longer. That's all. But I, I see, I could see the reason, you know, people would want to do it because it seems easy. But the problem is, is now in a scenario like that where you're freeing up a lot of fat, that would be exactly again another fasted scenario where that would make sense. If you're going to do something like that, you got to be super glucose depleted, uh, free up that, free up those calories, and then use them, right, type of thing. But um, yeah, it's false. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. True. True. It's true. <laughs> I'm just hearing the question. <laughs> you, you cannot spot reduce yes. without any yes. medical intervention. There okay. Um, if you take a week off from the gym, you will lose some of your hard-earned muscle. Yeah, that'd be false. <laughs> it's it's going to take you longer than a week of, of not working out to really lose muscle. There's actually been if you there's there was one there was one um, study done one time, and it was people who were it was actually cool because it was like a leucine an L leucine study. I'm big into taking L leucine, um, amino acids in particular, but leucine um, is like the the best amino acid you could take in terms of skeletal muscle building skeletal muscle. <clears throat> and they had guys. Um, that were they, they did a, a group of guys that were um, bedridden, and so there was one group that was bed, were two groups that were both bedridden, but one had a good amount of leucine, and the guys who had leucine lost absolutely nothing while they were bedridden for a week, and the guys who were um, bedridden that didn't have leucine lost a significant amount, which is kind of crazy to shows, right? It showed that hey, you know what, if you just are eating right and taking the right amino acids, mm -hmm. like. Muscle, losing muscle is pretty hard to do, right? You know, and so, and you have people like even like you, like after the Arnold, yeah, we took off say, months, you know, after month. not months. Well, legs, legs was a uh, oh okay. Legs, yeah. <laughs> well, after a season, after I've completed a season, I usually take off a week from the gym in general. Yeah. You know, um, I'll do like a little bit of active, um, you know, active kind of activities, <laughs> active activities. <laughs> you know, like that doesn't mean I'm just going to sit in front of the TV for a week straight. I'll go out and walk. I'll do something like that. But I'll take a week off from the gym, cardio and lifting for a week. And I think I really look forward to that sometimes. You know, when you get close to a show, it's like so hard because you're so drained and you're just fatigued. It's just nice to be like, oh, I'm waking up and uh, I can just relax a little bit. I actually look forward more to um, my week off from the gym more than like, okay, you can eat uh different foods now you know what i mean i look more forward to like the relaxation portion of it and that's my week of pampering massage facials get my nails done all that it's so nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah and you have guys like like even um like phil heath does it he takes off a lot of time after after a show like a lot of time ronnie coleman would take off a lot of time after a show um i know sean Roden took off two months or three months after a show like after the Olympia, like, and he was just like, a lot of these guys just do that. And I don't know, um, mm -hmm. obviously they're looking better every year. They're not looking worse. So right. yeah. So it doesn't leave as fast as people think it leaves. So yeah. 
I think it's like one of those things that's in your head. Like you feel like you didn't get a pump in a week, then you feel like you're losing your muscle. You yeah. know what I mean? I think that's it's just like a mental thing. It's like, oh my gosh, gotta get in there. <laughs> gotta get my muscle back. Um, all right, next up is consuming fats will make you fat. And I wanna say this one is partly true, only for the fact that fats do tend to get stored more oftentimes as fat than let's say protein, but it's not necessarily like, oh yeah, I had like two tablespoons of olive oil and it's just gonna go right to fat. So there's some exceptions, right? There's those little like, well, actually, it, it is pretty calorie dense as far as like the weight, but you know, then you gotta fit your macros anyway. So I, I FYM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the way um, that that works is so fat is the easiest thing to be stored as fat. So that's so if you were to like look at macros and you looked at like protein, carbs, and fats, at which one's the easiest to be stored as fat, and you did it as a hundred calories of each, how much of it could be stored as fat? Well, fat, 98 out of 100 calories can be stored as fat. It has a very low, we call a thermic effect, right? What we just talked about where your body needs to digest it. It's very easy to digest. So 98 of those calories can be stored right as fat. Now, carbohydrates is in the, the you know, it's always different based on people's digestive systems or anything too. Carbohydrates around 80 calories can be stored as fat. And then proteins around 72 calories can be stored as fat. So protein is the hardest Thing to convert to fat and that's why a high protein diet makes a lot of sense because then again you're manipulating like your thermic effect and your net total calories right so of course if you ate 500 calories and it was all from fat you're not going to store any of those fats as fat right if you ate now if you ate a 500 calorie surplus and those 500 calorie surplus was from fat yeah it'd be easier to store those 500 calories from um from from the from the fat because it's just easier to store that fat so so it's a it's a little deceptive and it's like answer but it's so yes calories are always the most important thing if you had a calorie deficit it wouldn't matter how much fat you ate if you had a calorie surplus i would probably be doing someone more of a high protein diet than a, than oh, yeah. a fat-based diet yeah we talked about that yeah. when in was it it would be two episodes ago now yeah, yeah. so if you want to get, you really got into that two episodes ago so you guys might want to check that out <laughs> after this podcast is over but i learned a lot too from your little speech at the end from yeah. proteins and occasionally i'll go off on a tangent yeah. you know what's going funny is that one of these days, it's someone gave us a suggestion. One of these days was to do an episode based on things we used to say and if yes. they're still valid and we agree on them. And yes. like, I'm curious of like which episodes I'll go back on and be like, oh yeah, it's different now. Like we got more research on because. Well, not even necessarily the podcast, but even like YouTube yeah. or even just things that you know you used to do. Yeah. Like how you used to eat every three hours or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't necessarily have to be. That's a good one. I should probably use that. Yeah, we're going to do an episode like that pretty soon. Yeah. And uh, it just takes a lot of like finding things yeah, we, we used to do. Yeah, we have to do our research. Yeah. But there's a lot of things I used to do that I used to think were like, I thought I was so cutting edge. Yeah. And now I'm like, man, why did I do that? So I'm curious of like 10 years from now, when we look at back at these ones, I was like, I can't believe I said that. I know, right? Oh, man. <laughs> well, there's already people out there that are be like, he's, dead, he's wrong. But I'm yeah. like, it's funny. That's just how it goes. Well, that's just how it goes with everything because there's always an argument in nutrition science. We're always science. evolving. Yeah. Science is evolving. So. Well, you can always make an argument. Like I can make counter arguments for my arguments. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem is like it's nutrition science. It's 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 very rarely is it ironclad, like right. very rarely. So true that, true that. So anyway. Well, anyway, uh, that is all the time we have for today's episode. But if you guys liked this, we can definitely make a part two because we have more on here. That's actually pretty so cool. We can totally do a part two if you guys want. So please let us know in that comment section below if you want to see a part two to this episode. I like it. It challenges because it challenges me to remember things and like keeps me thinking and then I start thinking like and then I'll like go research thing. I like it. It's cool. So awesome. anyway, thank you guys so much for your help with that. And we'll see you guys next time.